Is it, isn't the recipe buy Matt Garrett a lot of alcohol and then give him your laptop? <laughs> switch from like running the Ubuntu kernel to like top of tree git because it's got to work better than the Ubuntu one. Hardware dependent. Huh? Hardware dependent, I'm pretty sure. Bullshit, Solaris doesn't do it. Solaris has got fixed. One of the rare things, but it does. <laughs> uh, but that's actually one thing Solaris can do way better than, than Linux. I'm pretty sure it can. Because that's actually becoming a huge bottleneck. I keep finding when I go to go places that we discover, like, why, why, what's the problem is, and we'll look at, like, you know, basic fat network family back and forth, blah, 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 and we end up blowing out that entire implementation. So we see that. That happens. We can see that with MimTXD a lot. Hmm. Where we can just, uh, you know, basically blow through uh, whatever amount of IO that's available, and we just end up uh, end up farming ourselves on one core handling all the uh, interrupts. There's some kind of fire hose thing that I know that some people use to like push the IO between multiple processors, but it's either here or there, which yeah. doesn't do much jack. So but, I don't know. That's been fixed. I mean, we should go yell at the the session. Yeah. The right guys are here. We should go invade their session and just yell at them. Yeah, By yeah, the way, this is where you're... When I was on the flight here, I should have been, hey, Linus, can you fix this right now? Here? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a different stream, but after this place, this one, they are actually having the kernel questions where you ask for the problems with the kernel, and they try and solve them all. Sessions. Bring your laptop up and it's like plug in the projector and then fix, suspend, and resume. <laughs> or rather, usually fix, resume. Suspend works quite well. <laughs> I've got a database question. Uh, what's so special about mobs and PostgreSQL? <laughs> Who's PostgreSQL people? In a good or a bad way? In a general way. Well, in, in general, in all databases, blobs are typically just handled completely differently. Um, because so you have a table with just one column being important, one column. That's not too uncommon of a design. A lot of data, the, the, the different solutions you see in different databases, for not so much for databases which are, are like scattered databases, like one that uh, uh, Stuart works on, which is like uh, Stuart worked on, which was NDB, where they do things like they fragment up a blob and then push it out to multiple corners in a network. The, the common designs you usually see with blobs um, go back as like earlier. Oracle's early designs where they basically had a directory and they just shoved all the crap into a directory which was a blob. I think that was also common in that RD mess that, that uh, Jim Starkey worked on early on. So anyway, back to this though. A lot of databases are what we call blob pointers. So they'll put the row inside the day, inside a, a particular part of, of some kind of a page or in part of the stream, but they'll end up putting a pointer to a reference to a blob. The blobs are either then put into uh, like into a table, which is kind of eh, iffy in design, or what people will do is then put it into page space. So just like you have index pages, you'll have blob pages. Um, a third piece is to actually just put it in a, a separate directory and put it out in that directory and put it there. But that's that's kind of a typical way to handle blobs. Yeah. Well, so um, the reason why is so a lot of people, the reason this goes back is a lot have to do with uh, a lot of the databases implemented uh, blob pointers. So what you would have to do is you would fetch a row and the row would have a blob pointer with it and then you would do some kind of a, a get on the, the blob pointer to get the data back. Yeah, 
this is actually something that was really kind of different with MySQL when MySQL came out, is the fact that MySQL didn't treat a blob differently than any other type, so it was just passed back as a row point. The problem with this, though, it, well, the, the flip side of this means that well, it works very well as long as you can handle many lines the size of the blob, but if the blob is too big, um, then you run into many, many problems. So, for instance, well, technically MySQL could handle a 4 gig blob. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, only like, yeah, literally on a 16 gig machine it might work. Um, but if you took a traditional design with a blob pointer, you would fetch back in the blob pointer and pull back a certain section of range. So you just pull the beta back in a range. So, I don't know, there's plus and minuses to both sides. Personally, I, I'm not a big group. Blobs are, are technically uh, unstructured data, which really is kind of bullshit. They're completely structured. You just don't know what the internals to the actual blob is. So I actually am not a fan of putting large unstructured pieces of data in the database in the first place. You know, anybody who comes and says, oh, you're trying to stick CD images in the database, I think that's fucking nuts. Um, to even begin to do that stuff. You know, small images, I can see it's laziness to do it, but that's about it. For, for the, for if, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to figure out you know, where to stick you, you've got all these CD images or you've got all these thumbnails or, or whatever it is that, that you're doing, when, when, you know, when we'll see people using things like, things like MobileFS um, to, to stick that stuff out into, into, into file space land so that you can still operate on it from here with, the, with the API from, from MobileFS to, to get stuff in and out, but you're not... Um, uh, but you're not trying to actually stick the, the resources themselves into the, into the database. And that scales really, really well. <laughs> As opposed to uh, trying to scale lots of blobs in the database, which does not scale. So, but they can actually. So, uh, Live Journal, a fairly large site, um, at one of its peak, it was delivering thumbnails. So, all those little images for like movie icons and like people's face icons. It was delivering at peak 50 million uh, of those images a day out of its database. Um, and as far as like scale out of like, you know, drop the data in, replicate out to some read um, systems, works pretty well. And this is the one thing that, that I see people stick data in databases for sometimes, which probably the data should quote unquote shouldn't be in the database. It's just because databases understand replication, and frankly, file systems don't know how to do replication. So when you drop something down and you want it to actually replicate, well, wow, that's kind of cool. So anyway, we're supposed to be now asking more questions. Uh, yeah, my question is more on um, slow replication of databases, or more or less delayed. The uh, situation I've got is a Postgres database sitting in another country, and we don't really want to do the two-phase commit stuff because of the time delays, because it's going from Australia to D Dallas. In this case, we really want to have it replicating more like uh, the transaction logs being transferred across. I haven't really found anything that handles that area at the moment. Really, sort of like a, just a one-way transfer of the transactions. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, that's what we do for backups. It's just sort of like, like, you know, if the thing goes, blows up, I'd like to have like, as many of the transactions through the day at least down as I can. I have to worry about the last few on backups or whatever else I need to do to recover. And it's sort of like, don't seem to see anything in that area. Anyone got suggestions? So by the way, one thing is Oracle tried to do that early on. One of the early forms of replication design was two-phase commit. They got rid of that shit fast. It doesn't work. Um, the problem is that no two-phase commit design for, for replication scaling will actually ever scale whatsoever. We, all the database manufacturers learned that a long time ago. But there's like three or four different Postgres replication systems nowadays. So I would think one's got to be um, and there's some great things about using a two-phase, using a two-phase commit for replication because you get fully synchronous replication, but that doesn't really traditionally scale. So I'm surprised that there isn't one of the different uh, Postgres systems doesn't do it right. Um, I will tell you something that uh, I guess is sort of about, maybe or maybe within the domain. So um, uh, one of the things we're doing in Drizzle is we're redesigning the replication stream. And so the replication stream that we're redesigning uses a thing called protos. So every time we have to do a row conversion or, or an insert or you know an insert and update or whatever, we just build a proto from that or build a proto in a larger set of replication. What we're then doing is the current plan right now is we're going to take the protos up and we're going to shove those things into Gearman. And then we're going to have a Gearman system to just handle the, the replication for us from this point on. So what we can do then 
and where the story goes is that the protos are, are pretty defined enough that we can actually replicate into another database. So, for instance, you'll be able to say Drizzle, insert in your Drizzle, and we can populate an Oracle or a Postgres or a MySQL database, no problem. It's kind of, uh, kind of a cool thing that we've got the ability to do. Um, there's really no reason why somebody couldn't take like the designer piece where we take and build the protos and just shove that inside of Postgres and have Postgres deliver the same kind of protos into the German system and then German could replicate and then German could replicate all the Postgres stuff everywhere. Um, we've only talked about this to a couple of Postgres people um, so far, but because we're not that far along yet, and well, we're fairly long in parts of the design, but um, we're not fully there, so. That may be something to think about. Um, we're trying to build it so that um, most of everything that we do, uh, especially with Drizzle and the other projects I'm on, it's when we care about Drizzle, things like when we work with MimCached or Gearman or any other systems, we're pretty much trying to take like a, a database neutral approach to that. So the Gearman application system, in theory, if we get it right, should work with any database as long as somebody writes the connector for it. We're just, it we don't see any reason to have like 15 different open source replication projects. Let's just write one and use it for everything. I don't know if that buys you, but I, I'd still work on the Postgres replication projects because a bunch of them must, of them must be doing log shipping because I can't see a reason why you couldn't do log shipping off Postgres. I'm pretty sure there is one that does just plain log shipping, uh, but you can't run queries against the slave doing that. I think that's the, the thing. If you just use the log for recovery, you can't necessarily do the log shipping. I mean, the question of exactly what does Postgres has in the log. Does anybody know? Because with, uh, with the Maria, we can tell you do log shipping, but we have disabled the log for back and search with loaded in the file, uh, just because we can do a full recovery uh, without putting the full load there. And then they actually get a fast operation. We could put everything there, but currently it's disabled and we won't have it optionally in the future. Serious Postgres dev or user? Oh well. Yeah, I don't know. The Postgres has done a lot of good work uh, recently in getting their SMP stuff working so they can make use of multiple processors. But I have the last yeah. time I used it was like seven. Yeah, it makes up the big changes. Yeah, that's the last time. I used it six and six was a waste of time. I used it in seven because they said it was faster. Um, and it was okay, but then it became deadly slow again. Um, yeah, for the same project converted to MySQL well, went through. You know, but at the same time I, over the years I've had a lot of problems with MySQL cropping the database and that kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> I mean the, the fact that all the, the different open source databases are being built a bit differently means that all of them are turning out to have some area where they're much faster than the rest are, for whatever reason. I mean, uh, Postgres's uh, Postgres's uh, join optimizer is much more advanced than the one that MySQL has. So anything that's a whole lot of complex, uh, fairly complex queries, tends to work better in Postgres. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, it's got a better it's it's got a better design now. Thanks. Um, I work at the National Archives in Canberra and we use Postgres in production on uh, our networks there for preserving digital records. And um, were you asking who uses Postgres in a... Yeah. 
Yeah, so there you go, there's one. Um, we actually have uh, two completely separate networks that both store the same data. And um, one of the things I've been struggling with is a way to synchronize those two databases while remaining completely isolated and separate. Um, and it's been a bit of a you know, thorn in my side for a while. So I have actually started toying with the idea of using MySQL instead of Postgres. Um, so if any... Um, essentially, uh, we're just storing um, a whole bunch... OK. How can I explain this? Do you want to take over? Sure. Now, I'm not still in the database, a whole lot of uh, just metadata about the process of doing digital preservation, so it's just a whole bunch of, you know, little little text fields and relations, um, which is all managed by Hibernate. And the idea is that the two systems that have the same content in them should uh, ideally remain completely separate from each other, except that at any given point in time, we would like to be able to say, OK, let's join them together for a very short time and make sure that uh, whatever's been ingested into one is not replicated to the other. But we don't want to have a kind of master-slave situation where one's always the master and one's always the slave. So, for example, if we want to take one network completely down for a day, a week, or a month, we can do that. And, then when we bring it, and during that time, we can be ingesting into the other one and its database is getting updated all the time. And then when we bring the, the ones down back up, we can join them temporarily and say, OK, sync up and get everything across. Now, obviously, at the file system level, for, for the stuff that lives on the file system, that's kind of a fairly trivial async operation, but not so much for the databases. And so what we're looking at is a database solution that lets us do that. And at the moment, struggling with Postgres, and done some experiments with uh, MySQL, but haven't come up with an answer there either. So anybody who can think of a way to do a fairly non-traditional synchronizing operation, you know, really kind of a weird environment where we do have complete control over the systems, with effectively no users hanging off the systems at any time ever. Um, we are the only single user, so we can decide when we stop using it, join the things together, sync them, then unjoin them if you like. Um, suggestions would be welcomed. Actually, it's it's in um, uh, in in my in MySQL as long as you're using 5.0 or later. Which at this point, if you're not if you're using MySQL, you're not using long words. But it's a, almost a, it's a, an extremely common um, uh, circular replication setup with essentially having a circular replication to uh, two nodes. Each node is a master of the other and a slave of the other. Um, and it's asynchronous, so if you break the link, just break the link, and they each do their thing whenever you. So the, as long as we're uh, uh, having our time here, uh, who has actually looked at, uh, let's think of more of the new open source databases that some of you haven't probably looked at. How many of you all uh, today use uh, Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley database? 
Anybody still using the Berkeley database? One or two people hands? So there's a faster implementation of that. It's called Tokyo Cabinet. In fact, what's cool is it even has a thing called Tyrant hooked up to it that speaks the Memcached protocol. So you can use it as a distributed Memcached environment. So all basic key stuff. So if they're using the Berkeley database, you should probably be looking at Tokyo Cabinet. Um, it's a really impressive uh, uh, little database out of Japan. Um, another database, I mean, how many times do you find yourself that you just got objects uh, in this language called JSON? There's a, another cool database called CouchDB. Anybody here actually heard of CouchDB? Yeah, so CouchDB, CouchDB uh, takes a number of things that, uh, frankly, I think most of us have been scared to do for a long time and just does it. One, um, it doesn't use any kind of proprietary protocol. So like the whole thing of here's a driver for it, it just uses HTTP for its language. So you issue queries in HTTP against the database. Second of all, it actually stores all records and, and, re and responds with records in JSON, which is a JavaScript object implementation. So, and about every language out there at this point probably has a object to JSON converter. So you can just serialize objects into uh, JSON, send them to the uh, database, and the database then uh, does storage against it. It also has a built-in full text search, and I think they can do some MapReduce operations now as well which in the database world we frequently call those group buys, but oops, anyway. Uh, so that's something else that's actually out there. Called CouchDB, just like you would sit on a couch, couch database. So that's another database that's out there. Um, has anybody needed a big table-like implementation where you just need a big giant database to throw objects in that you can scale out across many hosts as you want to uh, with some indexing capabilities? There's a database out there called Hypertable. And Hypertable is kind of a takeoff of the HBase database. HBase is a back-end database to Hadoop. The cool thing about Hypertable, though, is all written in C. So as those guys are getting faster and better, well, I don't personally like having to uh, have Java implementation sitting around of anything. So it's kind of a nice uh, another da open source database out there. Um, let me think, other ones. How many people here sit in the room and run just analytics constantly? They need database where they throw vast sums of numbers in them, and they just need very fast queries run. Ad hoc, uh, what we call analytics, not so much data warehousing, but analytical queries. There are two databases I can think of. One I don't have any experience with, which is I think called Lucid, L-U-C-I-D, which had a nice paper last year at OzCon, which unfortunately I couldn't attend. So that's an analytics database that's out there. If you're using MySQL, there's a database called InfoBright. Um, and the InfoBright database is where they take MySQL back in 5.0, uh, cut it off, and put their own storage engine underneath it. Um, it can insert data. Uh, you basically, the open source version of it, they have that whole closed source versus open source thing, which personally I don't like. Um, but I think they're going to get smart about that and change that at some point. Um, but you can bulk load data into it. So you take your data set, bulk load data into it, and the thing is just ridiculously fast um, for doing ad hoc queries. So the kind of stuff that it takes most any database, I don't care what it is, unless it's something like a, a green plumber, a Teradata, um, that can take most database hours to run for queries, it can run it in just matters of seconds. Uh, it's really, really cool design. They are column stores, and what they do is they keep, um, when they do the insertion, they keep all these uh, statistical vectors going on inside of it, so they don't actually have to read all the data to make uh, aggregate queries work. Um, so that's their trick to them. Yes? Yeah, Memcached, let's see, how many forked versions of it we have nowadays? Memcached DB, we have Memcached Q. Uh, Toro, uh, Toro and uh, I'm trying to think uh, who was the other one, Trond, I've actually been working on uh, one of the up and coming pieces for Memcached D is we're going to take the back end out so that you can just plug new back ends in. And the hope is that then people won't get all nutty for uh, forking the project every other day to create a new kind of back end. Um, another thing, which unfortunately I don't think I have my slides for, uh, we, we put the, the Gearman project back together and have actually been uh, starting to publish it again. Uh, Gearman was the queue system that was written for Dango. So where Memcached D was for uh, caching, the Gearman system was for queuing, map reducing operations and all that. Um, we just rewrote the whole thing back in C. Um, I think we released a new version of it uh, last week. 
Uh, many women out there is like, uh, what did we put on the mailing list recently? Yahoo's got 160 some odd servers running it. Dig's got another 60 growing to 100 servers of it. Um, the human stuff's working really, really well right now. So if you need basically job operations, queuing type operations, or you want something that's a little lo more low level than Hadoop is for doing MapReduce operations, uh, it works really well. And the cool thing about Gearman is, is that workers and clients can be written in any language. So somebody can write a worker in Perl, and you can write your client faces with Python. Gearman doesn't really give a shit about what's on either side of itself. It takes all the data, translates it around. It's only the interface that's actually published. So you can push data back around as much as you want to, and it's all good. Oh, you're talking about uh, SimpleDB. Yeah, I've played with SimpleDB some. Um, let's see, it's a... Uh, I actually think long term, many of the aspects of its design are actually going to be much more common because it kind of reminds me of CouchDB in certain regards. There's a couple of problems with it that I wish they'd fix. Um, basically, the, uh, the row retrieval is, isn't all that sexy as far as I'm concerned. Being passing me all my IDs and then having to collect all my IDs is kind of a pain. Um, yeah, there's some other stuff too. Uh, but those guys seem to be working on it pretty quickly. I know it's not really the most popular of the Amazon services, but I think long term there's definitely a market out there for creating that. We've talked about um, inside of Drizzle, um, we can remove the protocol and without too much difficulty. Um, Drizzle's a, a micro. By the way, so how many people in the room know what Drizzle is? If I say it, okay. So, about, yeah, yeah, he works on it. So back in April, uh, we decided to. Okay, back in April, I decided to fork my SQL. Uh, if you want to hear more about it, there's a whole talk at the conference called Use the Fork Loop. Um, so what I did is I decided to fork it. Um, kind of had gotten tired of the, the design of my SQL, and I had many issues with it that a decade worth of, of anger towards it. Finally decided, let's go and fix this shit for, for good now. So we went in and started actually just fixing it. So one of the things, though, is that uh, Drizzle, unlike MySQL, is a microkernel design. Uh, meaning that the, the stuff that like, I originally pushed that would make MySQL much more playable is kind of religion within Drizzle. So many pieces of Drizzle are actually already plugins and it's growing. So we can separate many pieces out. So things like, for instance, the protocol stack, we're not too far from just being able to throw the protocol stack away and you could just send us queries over HTTP. Um, once we get more of the proto stuff done, you could send us queries in a, a lower level language than SQL and we can work through without ever passing through the parser. There's all kinds of cool shit we can do. Um, but that's what we did. But that's been going now since about April. Uh, you can uh, launchpad.net uh, slash drizzle, uh, or I think also drizzle.org also now goes to it as well. So, but that's been, there's been, uh, God, we've got, uh, I think we've got 42 active engineers right now working on it. So the development on it's going really fast. Um, and it's also kind of cool because anybody in the room here could sit down and if you found something you had a bug in, we'll, we'd happily accept patches. We're probably the most friendly project on the planet when it comes to accepting projects. So, anyway, that's my spiel there. Just about anybody's yeah, yeah. We, we <laughs> I'll even fix people's trees sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm already like, wait, that's not quite right. I'll just fix it. So let me see. So let's see, what else we got for, did you have a question? Okay. Um, I do a lot of work with OSP, but I'm not sure how many other people do that here. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have is right here. Like it, um, it's, you, you get a start accounting report, and then you get a live record, and you get a spot record. Yeah. Some of you might have a six week, ten week, yeah. continuous session. Yeah. So you have to somehow, once a month, say how much of the data did they use in that month? Oh. And there's no record of that because you might look at it four days after the, the rollover or something like that. So you want to know the record of how much data they were using inside of, inside of the database? Well, yes, it's a single row for it. So we've, I mean, the technique we've used is to synthetically create daily records. But the, the radius server has no understanding of that. So the thing you could do in Drizzle in this case, for instance, um, our logging system, uh, like what you think of like the slow query log and the general log and all that, that's all a big plug-in for us. So you could take statistical data, constantly write it out, and then just do an aggregate against that at the end and pick, your, uh, pick up your day logs. Um, our logging systems, the two logging systems that we have pushed in the code right now, one is a flat file system. 
Um, and the logging API is really but simple to So writing your own logging module for Drizzle is really, really easy. I think Mark wrote the, we have a, a syslog one nowadays as well. So we can just send all errors and warnings to syslog. And I think Mark wrote that in about six hours. Um, just because the API, the API for logging in Drizzle is really, really cake to do. You're basically given an object and you can do anything with that object you want. So in our world, what, so what I would do is I would just take some of the aggregate data and either every so often or over when a user exits the query, um, just ship that data into a central system. I mean, that's what I would do. Hell, it would actually, so in our world, the easiest thing would be to do, let me think about this. Off the top of my head is you could have the, um, every 20th record or when the user exited the database, you could send data out to the logging API. Uh, and you can even send that information you're asking for directly into syslog as a warning, and then have the syslog daemon routed into a central syslog server and just collect the data off that. There are so many ways to cut this apart in our world. Send that stuff into sys. something like that. Anyway, he published uh, uh, an example of using even just Gearman built into MySQL using user-defined functions. And there's been talk already of getting some Postgres stuff going for that as well. But uh, yeah, Gearman can handle all that stuff. So you might just looking. Yeah. Yeah, Gearman's one of those kind of like th uh, uh, undiscovered uh, uh, wonderful things that uh, uh, thankfully we're actually starting to be able to publish more about. Anyway. How much more time am I supposed to buy over? Do you have another speaker? Yeah, Iron's on in 10 minutes. Oh, OK. How are your slides going? <laughs> no slides. It's OK. OK, so we're continuing the tradition of uh, unorganized. So anyway, I want to think, what other uh, open source databases have been released recently that uh, people don't know about? I think that's about it. So bigger ones I watch CouchDB, HyperTable, and then uh, Tokyo Cabinet. Also, something to talk about. Work. I'll take credit for Eric's work right now. I've been writing this great library. Um, <laughs> uh, and Eric's been stealing it and committing it. Um, Eric's been writing a new, a new library uh, for, for uh, the connections um, uh, it's called, oddly enough, Lib Drizzle. Um, but uh, one of the nice things about it so far, so it's, it's, it's designed very similar um, in the way that it's structured and put together to how the, the Lib Nimcache D uh, library is so it's it's um, it's it's pretty lightweight and um, and friendly to, to work with and you can um, 
you can you can manage your memory allocation more specifically or not depending on which camp of people you're falling into. But it's it's already uh, multi-protocol aware, so it, it will talk to MySQL databases and to Drizzle da databases at the moment. Um, and it does some things that the MySQL, the current MySQL client library does not do, um, like uh, asynchronous queries and non-blocking I/O and stuff like that. So it's actually um, it's actually quickly becoming a better MySQL client library than the MySQL client library, and it has the the, the added benefit of being able to talk to Drizzle as well. So it may be a decent idea, even if you even if you aren't a candidate for playing with Drizzle in the near future, to start looking at using the Drizzle client library to talk to your MySQL servers, because you've got some some new fondness there. Um, uh, and and we'll probably be about probably ready to to roll into production. You know, pretty. Uh, pretty soon, it's, it's, it's not that much the library really has to do. I mean, it's you know, it's a little bit easier to get that up and going. And also, for people that are worried about this sort of thing, it's uh, BSD licensed rather than GPL. So if you need to, if you need to, in, you know, incorporate it into something, uh, that's a little bit easier. So for what that's worth, um, and stuff. Don't you love licensing? Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm I'm one of the people that's a fan of the MySQL client lab building GPL, but I'm a GPL bigot, so you know. <coughs> I, I, I understand that other people don't share my opinions on that, and you're all wrong. But I love you anyway. We're not arrogant. We're just correct. Huh? <laughs> I'll find water or someone to speak. <laughs> Yeah, I did do interest this morning. And then more people came. I'm not playing a delay, not to stand out of us. Woohoo! When? The hotel. <laughs> cool. Otherwise, in a few minutes, we have Aryan, who ran out of the room. Talking about our Delta. Well, let's have a few minutes. <laughs> Check my email.